In this video, I'm putting more than a dozen pieces of new gear to the test. It's springtime in the Hocking Hills region of my home state of Ohio, and I'm looking forward to the same woods wandering and quiet evenings around a campfire that my personal heroes Daniel Boone and Simon Kenton would have experienced here in the Ohio country just 250 years ago. And for the first time, I've improved my kit to a point that I hope will enable me to really slip into their mindset. To be clear, there's still plenty to improve on. There's areas of my kit that need a lot of work. There's things I still need to buy, things I need to make. But in the last year, my philosophy's changed quite a bit. I used to use cheap stand-ins in certain areas, and now I've cut those things away. I'm just making do without, as many frontiersmen would have done. And still, I have much more gear than a lot of frontiersmen may have had. It's been a year since my last video. Improving my kit has been the constant backdrop against fighting through my last year of college, securing a full-time job, and keeping up with everything else that life can throw at a kid coming into true adulthood. This year I've made new leggings, a new shot pouch, lots of moccasins of varying patterns, candles, period waterproofing recipes, and market wallets for carrying my gear, even a period sewing kit. Every project has brought new lessons, most notably how to sew a few 18th century stitches, how to keep your feet warm and dry in the winter, and when to swallow your pride and buy something more authentic from someone who knows more and has access to more authentic materials. That's what I did when it came to period winter socks, mittens, and a hat from South Union Mills. Man, those are nice. And it's what I've done as I acquired a new shirt, knife, tomahawk, canteen, and even a buffalo hide. All very functional and increasingly historically accurate additions to my gear. One impediment to really pursuing this hobby as a college kid living in a dorm has been the storage of my rifle. I gotta keep it off campus. So I'm headed to a friend's place right now to pick that up and then I'll be able to head out. One more obstacle that I've had to work to overcome throughout these college years is transportation. I left my car at home for the first three years of my college career because it's expensive to park on campus in the city. And um, finally, as a senior, you know, I brought the car down to campus, which means that I can get out and go to camps like this one pretty spontaneously if I wanted to. At one point, I was robbed of a, a good opportunity to get out and enjoy this hobby because to drive home, get the car, come back to campus, and then go to that event and do it all over again to get the car back home afterwards, it would have turned a four-hour drive into a 12-hour drive. Um, and that's the kind of thing where, you know, I can make sacrifices to pursue this hobby, but 12 hours in the car on a weekend uh, that's only 48 hours long, that's getting to be a big ask. So I'm really excited to have the car back. And like I've said earlier, being off in autonomous adulthood is really going to give me those opportunities to get out and pursue this passion uh, a lot more seriously. The Hocking Hills region in southeastern Ohio brings three to five million tourists a year, putting it even with Yellowstone or Yosemite National Parks. It's a region filled with caves, waterfalls, gorges, and rock outcrops, the best of which are all protected by the Hocking Hills State Park. Hocking Hills is one of the few places in Ohio where there are bobcat and black bear sightings, and as Ohio whitetail hunters will tell you, monster bucks often come from this area. Overall, the habitat in this region is a wildlife sanctuary. This property is a woodland paradise. I love being able to get out onto private land like this. I feel so grateful to have friends who allow me to come out and use their property for historical camping like this. The great thing about being on private property is that you don't have to wear blaze orange to feel safe. There's no hunting or shooting allowed on this land. It's like a nature preserve and it's beautiful, pristine wilderness. Um, but no blaze orange. You don't have to worry about getting out into the forest and bumping somebody's deer. There's no trail cams as you come around the bend. There's no deer stands up in the trees. Unfortunately, those are all things I've run into before. I've bumped into hunters out in the woods. I've seen those trail cams all over the place. And that kind of invades your 18th century mindset that you start to get into as you walk off away from your vehicle. Um, it, it can really put a damper on the, the historical mood. So once again, so fortunate to be able to get out and enjoy a time like this uh, on a property like this one. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting out in the woods. I've camped here twice before, once with friends and once alone in historical kit. 
On the hike out from my first camp here, my old roommate's brother pulled me off the trail to point out a rock outcrop big enough to sleep in. When I came back here a few months ago for a historical camp, I shot an entire video about my experience sleeping in that outcrop, but I lost the best footage to technical problems. This video is my shot at redemption, just as much as it is an opportunity to get out of the city and into the woods. When I do get out into the woods, one of the first things I always notice is the smell. Earth is shaking off the dead of winter. It's a beautiful time to be out in the forest. When the Shawnee found Daniel Boone hunting in Kentucky in 1770, he evaded them by staying in limestone caves along the Kentucky River. A handful of caves here in the Hawking area bear names and dates from that same frontier period, and with the rich American Indian history on this land, there is no doubt that every cave and outcrop had been explored long before white men pushed into the Ohio interior. Some of the caves and outcrops have documented instances of Miami or Shawnee camping there, or a little later, frontiersmen tucking themselves away there for the night. It's not hard to imagine that I've shared this nook with at least a handful of people over the last few hundred or even thousand years. This is what living history is all about. It might be hard to believe, but second to my rifle, I'm most proud of my tump line. By my estimate, weaving this strap took nearly 100 total hours. That's partly because it was my first time weaving, and partly because I was insisting on perfection. I spent hours cinching every knot tightly into place and going back to correct mistakes. This tump line was the staple project throughout the fall of my senior year. It gave me something mindless to do while prepping for exams, and it carries a lot of good memories. Now, as I discussed earlier, it's a very functional piece of my kit, and I expect to get many years out of it. Ten years from now, my videos will have improved dramatically, but this tump line may very well still be in them. I usually get questions about my bedroll, so I want to show you how it all comes together. I use my oil cloth as the exterior if I'm not using it for shelter, then I lay my buffalo hide inside followed by my wool blankets. You can see here that the hide is oriented to the right and the oil cloth folds over to the left, creating an envelope that I can pull closed if it starts to rain or if I'm getting a lot of bugs. I don't have any plans for today except to make dinner by the fire later tonight and I'll probably have a fire in the morning so in the back of my mind I know I need to make some wood for that fire later but for now, I'm just going to relax, give myself a few minutes, have a little snack, a little pick-me-up. And, um, you know, this is a beautiful vantage point. I've got this natural shelter here, which is awesome. You can't beat that. But from here, you can also look out down my little hill here. There's a creek, and on the other side, I've got about another 100 yards of visibility. The spring growth isn't thick enough yet that you can't see through it. So I'm really enjoying just sitting here. I've seen some squirrels chasing each other on the other side of the creek, listening to the birds. It's the perfect time of year to be out in the woods, taking in the sights and the smells and the sounds. Um, and it is just relaxing on a different level. You can't touch anything like this in the city. I think axes are a really commonly overlooked piece of gear in most 18th century kits. Big historical events supply wood and most people out doing their own living history can make do using old beater tomahawks, which is what I'm doing here, but soon I'll need to upgrade. I heard a great tip one time from Peter Kelly of the Woodland Escape YouTube channel. If you're not familiar, he's a gentleman who lives up in Canada. He's built his own cabin, his own forge. He builds these beautiful birch bark canoes does a really great job with uh, living history with uh, you know, both in front of the camera and behind it his wife edits his videos they together produce some really great work um, I actually had the opportunity to meet him at this most recent school of the long hunter he was in attendance we actually got to film a quick interview which is posted on his channel I'll leave the link to that in the video description you can watch it afterward 
Um, anyways, Peter in a winter environment was talking about how he'll get out and collect the amount of wood he thinks he needs and then he'll go out and double it. And I think that's a pretty good idea. You can always scatter that wood before you leave if you have extra, but man, is it a bother to get up and get dressed in the middle of the night if you run out of wood. Now it's only gonna get down to about 40 degrees tonight. I don't need a fire all night to stay warm. I'll be just fine in my buffalo hide. But uh, I do kind of want to abide by that rule in today's case. I'm looking to have enough wood for dinner tonight and for breakfast in the morning. The long hunters and scouts of the 18th century would have brought out pack horses with all kinds of gear. Today, most of us don't have the horses or canoes to replicate that, so we end up taking what we can on our backs. And it's probably a kind of funky amount of gear for the period. It's definitely more than you would have on a hunt, for example, but it's far less than you might have at a semi-permanent seasonal trapper's camp. Right as I was getting dressed proper again, uh, some storm clouds rolled in and a little light drizzle has started. So I'm gonna take that as my signal to hunker down for the night. I thought about going out and hiking, but I have all day tomorrow to do that. And it seems like this will blow through overnight. So I'm looking forward to sitting here on the fire. Fortunately, I got myself plenty of wood before the weather turned. I've got enough to easily light a fire right now and uh, still have enough to get myself through dinner and through uh, breakfast in the morning. Unfortunately, lighting my fire means turning to a modern shovel. In an effort to leave no trace at this site, I'm digging out a pretty good hole for my fire that I can cover before I leave. Frontiersmen may not have abided by today's conservation principles, but I recommend that you do. It's up to you to keep this hobby's good name by showing some courtesy to landowners and wildlife. The fire situation at this site might be one of the best parts about it. I almost didn't need a shovel. The root ball from the fallen tree in front of the outcrop left a good sized hole in the ground, and when it fell, those roots must have pulled up a lot of rock and soil. I think that soil fell away over time, and the rocks fell down out of the roots as it did, leaving a hole with some rocks in it. It's the perfect natural setup for a fire pit. I do want to clarify that this ring is not as big as it might look. I'm using a fisheye lens on my camera for these tight shots in and around the face of the outcrop, so the proportions are a little distorted. Well, I got my fire going. It only took one light and uh, it's already got a little bed of coals going in there. It was such a great thing that I was able to get out and get that dry wood when I did. The sun's out now, it's beautiful, but I would have had a hard time finding dry wood at this point in the day. That is just glazed. Oh, that looks so good. That is just a beautiful turkey leg. I am so excited to bite into this thing. 
dinners over the fire are always a different thing and uh, every single one of them is special. I, I savor these. I spend so much time, or I should say I've spent so much time these past four years eating college dining hall food that to get out here in the woods with a turkey leg over the fire is just the best. I was laughing on my way out of the store today thinking about how awesome this was gonna be and it delivered. Hot chocolate recipe is real easy. <clears throat> can be done with water or milk. I got some milk tonight I'm using. I just dropped in uh, four or five little squares of 100% uh, cacao. It's real strong chocolate. You eat it plain, it's real bitter. You add it to milk like this, well, it's still pretty bitter, uh, but that's the way the recipe was made in the 18th century. You can add sugar to taste, and I brought a little bag of sugar. I don't know how common uh, the addition of sugar would have been in the 18th century. I think this was just taken to be a pretty bitter drink. Um, but another drink nonetheless, and something else that you could drink besides water or alcohol. Chocolate would have been a pretty common trade item. Uh, you know, a lot of people seem to forget that the long hunter, the frontiersman, the scout in between the frontier stations, those people were living in the middle of a global economy with reach to products that were being manufactured in mass in London. Many of their knives, for example, came off boats. They're imported, cheap knives. Um, chocolate would have been the same way, you know, available uh, readily from traders and such, and would have come most likely from South America and part of a global trade. I'm warm, full, and tired. And as I started to get ready for bed, I noticed I had a few visitors. Come on, man. Come on. As I tuck into my buffalo hide, I thought back on a few stories. Nighttime raids, robberies, and ambushes from Ohio's frontier period. It's not hard to see how somebody out here would have fallen asleep, totally exhausted, to wake up in a real pinch with some unfriendly elements in their camp. I get some of my best sleep in the woods, so it's a good thing my only visitors tonight will be bugs. That really puts things into perspective. Apple pie oatmeal has gotten me through a lot of college breakfasts too. It's been a trick of mine. I got a little kitchen in the dorm and I uh, don't want to go cooking banquets in there necessarily, but this here is uh, real easy. 
Now in the 18th century, I don't know how common it would have been to spend a leisurely morning like this around the fire, getting a nice cook fire with these coals for your coffee and your oatmeal, sitting here for an hour, taking in the sounds of the forest. I think people were getting up and moving and you would start to take all this beauty for granted after you know a couple of weeks of being out there. So you know it's it's a privilege to be able to practice these 18th century methods and things in modern times with clean water, unlimited amounts of time compared to what people were working with in the period. Um, it's really a it's a great thing, but if you indulge too much in those things, it can also rob you of that 18th century experience. A large part of frontier life, I truly believe, would have been spent suffering. People were gritting their lives out of the land. Um, just the conditions don't even compare to even the minimum standard of living in America today. We enjoy so much luxury compared to what people experienced in the 1700s out in this land. So it's great to sit here and to take in the woods, but you gotta remind yourself that this kind of lounging around would not have been commonplace. I've picked up all my shooting equipment from vendors at the National Muzzleloading Rifle Association's annual spring shoots. I can't recommend those events enough, especially if you're a new shooter. I'll get a full-length video together about casting ball with a lot more information about my shooting supplies sometime soon. My breakfast was too hot to eat, but there was a chill in the air, so I decided to stay moving by spreading what was left of my firewood and getting my things together. It's really shaped up to be a beautiful morning. I've got a little bit of logistics to handle. I need to get that buffalo hide and some modern camera equipment back out to the vehicle. So I'm gonna make that load, but I'm caching a lot of my gear here and that'll be a stop on my way. Once I've made a loop around the property doing a little exploring, I'll stop back here, collect my things and we'll make the final hike out. I can never leave a fire without first putting my hand directly on the coals and it's gotta be out cold. Off camera, I moved water up from the creek and saturated the fire ring. I'll spread leaves over the whole site, just as it was when I got here, until I'm confident that the landowners would not have been able to tell that I ever camped here. The leave no trace principles from scouting still run thick in my blood, and I know frontiersmen sometimes tried to camouflage their sites in the same way.
two things that I'm looking for on this hike at this past year's school, the Long Hunter. There's a great demonstration about fire starting. And uh, I've been getting anxious since that demonstration to get rid of char cloth. You know, I've carried a tinder box, little tin that you can put char cloth in, little pieces of rope to use as tinder. Yeah, frontiersmen were not running around burning up pieces of cloth to be used in future fires. And if they had rope, they certainly weren't burning it. So what we explored in that demonstration were all these alternative methods. <laughs> really, char cloth is the alternative method. All of these primary methods for fire starting from the 18th century using chaga and different types of fungus and punk wood. Now, I don't have high hopes for finding any fungi out here, not at this time of year, but I would like to find a little bit of punk wood, just enough to fill up my tinder box once or twice over, and I'll use that at future fires. I actually burned the last of my char cloth at this camp, and my goal is to never use char cloth for a fire again. The other thing I'm looking for is a nice little piece of river rock. Sandstone is really common here in Ohio, so I'm looking for a nice little piece of sandstone out of the creek. Um, I want to use that as a whetstone. Unfortunately, modern whetstones have made themselves commonplace in a lot of historical camps. And I think people are kind of shy of just taking a regular flat river rock and putting it to their nice knives and tomahawks. But I was talking to Simeon England at this most recent School of the Long Hunter, and you know I noticed that he had some river rocks that he was using to sharpen up a knife. And so we struck up a conversation. He was talking about how, and it made sense as soon as he said it, those guys back in the 18th century, they didn't have modern whetstones. They didn't have some rectangular cutout piece of rock that was imported from some other state or country to sharpen their knives. I mean, I'm sure those things were around, but why carry something like that back out onto the frontier with you and you can stoop down and pick something up out of the creek. So that's another thing I want to move away from is that modern whetstone. I followed some drainage here down to a creek that marks the property line. I'm going to do a little hunting around, see if I can't find myself a nice whetstone. All things considered, this was a great culmination of my college career. My kit is better than ever before, and I'm headed into real adulthood with a good foundation of 18th century knowledge, a few good mentors in this hobby, and a great group of viewers like you that watch my videos all the way through. Leave a comment starting with the word hawking so I know if you made it. I also want to thank my patrons on Patreon for sticking by me these past few years. Your financial support goes a long way towards securing future content. Thanks again for watching.